you know, for a lot of people, um, this section will be very familiar and, um, and so on. Like uh, a lot of people um, have heard this, you know, hundreds of times before and so on. Um, but just based on a lot of the questions that we, we've been getting, um, I figured it would be good to go through um, and kind of talk about the overall vision for PL from the founding um, to now and kind of carrying on in, in the future. So we're gonna do this in uh, four sections, kind of um, first off, talk about the mission and vision of PL, kind of the why, the what, and the how we do, do that. Uh, we're gonna take a brief look at PL's past, like the first 10 years. We're gonna look at how the network um, operates now in the, in the present, and then we're gonna look ahead uh, to the future. So um, PL's about driving breakthroughs in computing to push humanity forward. That is a broad uh, statement, and it's intentionally broad, um, and it comes from thinking about the massive scale changes that are going to um, uh, happen, have already been happening and are going to be accelerating uh, for humanity in the, in the next um, you know, 100 years and, and so on. Uh, things will be built, implemented, deployed that will change what it means to be human even more than it already has, right? So when you think about uh, your personal life and you know, what you are as a human with these kind of supercomputers in your pocket and your capability set, being able to interact with humans uh, all over the world, um, you're just a different kind of thing than humans 100 years ago, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 10,000 years ago. And so that kind of shift will accelerate through whole ranges of technologies that, um, that will arrive in the next 100 years, um, next 10, 20, 30 years. Um, and so what the goal of the network is to be able to both um, accelerate some of those changes, uh, but, I, but more important than that, navigate towards safe outcomes through those changes, because those changes can, be, can create massive upheavals, and you want to direct the development towards uh, good, safe outcomes. Um, there's a lot embedded in that, and that could be like you know, whole conferences just about it's like how to do that. Um, uh, so in general, um, the kind of broader vision of PL is to build this uh, innovation network uh, this used to say, you know, an R&D company, and that shifted in the last three years. Uh, we'll talk through, through why. Uh, but the, the rest of the picture um, remains the same, which is uh, to build a full uh, research and development pipeline across the entire um, thing from early research all the way into uh, product building and deployment and scaling. Uh, we want a world-class uh, set of teams and network. Uh, we are very strongly uh, into open source and open um, technologies, uh, and we lean on the crypto and VC business model. Uh, to create, support, and grow lots of projects. So um, in the last uh, lab week, <clears throat> I gave this uh, PL vision talk. Um, I'm gonna plug it again here uh, because a lot of the questions that I saw uh, coming through are just straight up in that, in that talk. So I'm gonna give a summary of it now, but it's gonna be very compressed. If you want to unpack it more, recommend you go just look at the summit uh, talk, um, especially after kind of thinking through a lot of the stuff today. and. Um, and I'm also very happy to have problem solving breakout session on digging into any of this that, that is still kind of um, unclear for people and, and, and so on. So the, the broad picture of um, you know, uh, pushing humanity forward comes from looking at the past and looking at the present and the future. Uh, we've had this massive scale global improvement over the last few um, uh, hundred years. Uh, we've also lever gotten ourselves into a position where we have technologies that can uh, wi <laughs> wipe ourselves out, and uh, we're having this massive extinction event across uh, the whole planet. We have massive challenges. We've become aware that, um, hey, we can accidentally um, wipe ourselves out but either in, by our own doing or by omission of not solving some problem that, is, that might happen. At the same time, we have this super crazy phase transition um, where computing is just a, a super different kind of thing, and we're developing at, at a fast rate. And if you know, things weren't more volatile, um, we just have inadequate macro systems to handle this kind of change at the rate that it's going in. Um, and so there's kind of um, tough problems there to solve in terms of how to orient the, um, the, the global um, landscape towards, uh, towards good outcomes. Um, I'm gonna hold questions for the Q&A because we could probably be, if I start taking questions, we're gonna um, the really length of time, but um, write it down and then let's make sure that we cover it. So now kind of, that's kind of the broad why. Um, I'm gonna talk about kind of concrete what, so uh, get very specific for a moment and then back into how we can do those specific things. 
Uh, so broadly, there's, um, there's a lot of submissions in this kind of broader picture that a lot of us have been working on for, for many years that a lot of us really care uh, very deeply about that are interconnected in ways. Um, and this is not comprehensive. There's a lot of people uh, working across the network on a whole bunch of other um, range of things, uh, but it's broadly related to this, um, to, to this kind of um, swath of things. Um, you know, first and foremost, uh, PL started with IPFS and Filecoin and Lip2P and projects about securing the internet um, and establishing digital human rights. Uh, I'll go into that in a moment. Um, uh, we also discovered through crypto and smart contracts and blockchains and so on um, that you could actually deploy some um, new structures that could shift how economies work globally and how governance systems work globally. And that's a very powerful um, technology that um, you know, I did, certainly didn't anticipate when, we, when I was first starting PL. Um, and though it was talked about in a lot of CS literature and um, broad economics uh, literature and so on, um, it wasn't clear just how um, straightforward and easy it has been. Like we've built this massive scale new financial rails infrastructure and you can deploy new incentive structures into the, into the world. Um, and, we, we, and that has been a relatively easy um, uh, thing relative to many other you know, build outs of other industries and infrastructure. So that, that is very promising as an opportunity. Uh, and then broadly, there's a whole range of other um, shifts in, in computing technology that are going to be arriving, um, shifts in, in you know, simple interfaces like VR and AR, where those kind of like are simple translations of uh, what we're used to today, but just in a kind of more immersive environment, uh, to then major shifts like um, the latest uh, super advanced um, AI models, uh, eventually getting to things like AGI, um, robotics, um, brain-computer interfaces, whole brain emulation, and so on. So this swath of technologies um, <coughs> is going to come with all kinds of super difficult challenges. Um, and, and it's one of those things where it, innovation can't, like this, um, can't really be stopped in a sense. It can only be delayed or accelerated. And you want to think carefully about the sequencing of these things to aim for good, good safe outcomes. So you know, concretely in each one of these, um, and you know, I've condensed here what normally could be like whole talks into a into a into a um, uh, short segment. But a lot of you are very familiar with this. Um, the securing the internet and establishing digital human rights thing comes from observing that um, the internet and the computing infrastructure that we have now has connected the species in a really um, amazing open uh, sort of way, and has given us the ability to grant superpowers to each other by just writing some software. Um, some applications and deploying them worldwide. Um, and at the same time, that same infrastructure can be used for all kinds of um, bad outcomes. And in particular, there's um, a lot of um, opportunity for um, kind of certain kinds of central control failure modes um, where you know, the, the kinds of like um, digital totalitarian kind of states that you could build in the, it now or in the near future um, just kind of eclipse whatever we've imagined in the past uh, in terms of how bad uh, things could things could get, uh, so it's pretty important to bake in human rights and our notion of human rights into the internet now, um, before those kinds of things emerge to prevent those things from emerging in the first place. And um, there's lots of ways to do this and lots of um, approaches and so on. Um, one way that uh, the broad Web3 community has been following this is by thinking of specific human rights, thinking of systems that can give you those rights and then implementing and deploying those systems worldwide, and to try and build those so they don't depend on corporations or governments, because those are um, coerceable and, and can change um, um, uh, fairly quickly, and instead lean on large-scale incentive structures um, that can coordinate lots of groups uh, around the world. Uh, again, this is a huge um, guess and bet that this could uh, lead to a, a whole set of better outcomes, um, but you know, none of this is at all um, kind of guaranteed in any way. Uh, the Web3 community in general has been pushing for this sort of um, uh, better safety model. Uh, there's a lot of people across the network that have been working on this particular mission. Lots of projects. This is where PL got its start. Um, projects like IPFS and Filecoin, um, uh, IPLD, Ethereum itself. We were very involved. We've been very involved in the Ethereum community for, from the beginning. Things like DRAN, Lip2P, Bacalao, and a ton of others. And this is a showing of a bunch of the teams across the network that are just working on this. Um, this probably misses a bunch of others. I just kind of did a quick filter. Um, 
but you know, lots of humans and lots of organizations and communities are working towards um, this particular goal set. Now, kind of in terms of upgrading economies and governance systems, uh, this comes from thinking about that kind of inadequate macro systems problem space, thinking about you know, the messes in, in the landscape of funding. Um, when you think about the last 100, 100 years or so, um, we've advanced our understanding of what's important to do, and we've advanced our understanding of how to develop really uh, breakthrough, um, broad, broadly globally improving um, technologies, products, services, uh, systems, and so on. Um, but the incentive structures that we have globally um, don't quite lead to the best outcomes. Um, and you see all kinds of really uh, messed up um, situations all over the place. Things like you know, the R&D budget of the world um, remaining roughly the same as you know, 50, uh, 50, 60 years ago in, in actual like, amounts of, uh, of value in, in dollars or any other currency, uh, even though <laughs> the world has inflated the cur those currencies dramatically more in that time period. Um, and uh, it's very difficult to motivate the addition of new um, whole-scale whole new kind of um, funding agencies for new things. Uh, there was like a, this very interesting period in kind of post-World War II where um, the US especially, but um, uh, also uh, many other countries, uh, worked pretty hard to set up whole new um, R&D infrastructure uh, to carry on the kind of the speed of innovation that, that um, the war had um, created. Uh, and then aim it towards solving broad scales, um, scale set of problems. Um, and the, the, the Cold War gave this, this ability to kind of create new agencies and so on, out of which we've got things like NASA, things like DARPA that ended up building the internet and so on. Uh, and yet that kind of innovation is, is, has sort of stalled out. <clears throat> There's still a lot of that kind of innovation, but it's not yet proportionally, it's not proportionally the same scale that it was before. Um, however, uh, with like crypto is a super interesting set of systems where when you look at the scales of funding that are available to these um, crypto networks and you think of them scaling, I don't know, one, two, maybe three orders of magnitude more in value, uh, at that scale, crypto networks can actually start funding R&D at the scale of nation states, which is a super crazy realization. I kind of um, <laughs> realized this a, a few years ago and it was kind of um, mind blowing that you could actually um, build and fund things like DARPA, things like um, uh, uh, all of the different kind of funding agencies out of crypto networks. Um, now crypto has to scale to be able to get there, but um, uh, and we have to figure out how the mechanisms to be able to do that, uh, but that, that kind of thing is possible. <coughs> so, so that thinking plus thinking about a bunch of other problems like climate change and many other kind of more local um, uh, classic economic failures um, led us and many other groups to um, develop a bunch of the systems in kind of public goods funding and, and this kind of, um, th this kind of structu structuring of, of coordinating broad groups to develop, fund, um, uh, maintain, sustain, and grow these, this infrastructure that is, that is um, vital to, uh, to all of us. <coughs> There's a lot of teams working on this uh, across the network. This is, of course, much smaller than the prior one because it's newer. Um, but this is just a, 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 uh, a snapshot of uh, a few of the teams and projects and groups uh, working on this. And there's many more across the, the broad uh, Web3 ecosystem. I think this kind of thing will, if, if we can have some good short-term um, successes, uh, we could probably scale this quite a bit. Now, kind of zooming out for a moment, um, going back to this broader uh, technology picture, um, the, the ordering of these technologies is going to be um, uh, very important to get right. And what kind of capabilities get unlocked and become enabled globally um, and what they afford to various groups uh, is going to significantly shift the outcomes for, for all of us globally um, and, 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 and it certainly shift the outcomes locally in a bunch of places. Uh, and kind of our, our thinking around uh, R&D in general um, is that this, this, broad, this happens in this broad, larger scale pipeline going from early research and um, things like, you know, you can think of academic research and so on, um, and you uh, develop new ideas, you try out um, various different possibilities, uh, you develop a conceptual theoretical framework for things, then you start applying that into devices or concepts or structures. Uh, some of those might work out and, and pan out, uh, 
uh, in the near term. Some of those will sit on shelves for decades even. Um, you know, wireless technology, for example, sat on, shell, on a shelf for a decade uh, before it was um, broadly useful. Uh, and then over time, you need a lot of uh, effort and teams uh, and projects working on developing those things to find the concrete applications that will get you there. Um, and so the, that requires not just a single team, it requires many, multiple different teams pursuing different lines of thinking, different lines of development in that large fan out space. Um, and one of the kind of most hardest parts about this R&D pipeline is that usually startups start very late in this, in this pipeline. Um, they start kind of towards the later half of it. And at that point, and startups are the, currently the best way to kind of capture some amount of the financial return from those technology uh, developments uh, to then be able to kind of cycle back the, um, the ROI to the beginning of the pipeline. Um, and so you, you really need to have a kind of network-oriented structure to be able to develop these, these kinds of things in the long term and at scale, um, and then be able to um, uh, leverage the returns of startups and so on. Um, the, the kind of broad innovation uh, like this, um, yeah, anyway, so uh, we both want to accelerate certain um, lines of, this, of, of these kinds of technologies, and we want to slow down um, others, or at least kind of sequence the, the, um, these to some extent to try and maximize um, uh, the outcomes for safety. Uh, there's a number of organizations in the network already working on this uh, kind of thing. Um, these, many of these organizations uh, were started um, kind of around the same time as PL or, or a little bit before, a little bit after. Well, Foresight is pretty old, but um, FLI and FHI are, are fairly new. Um, Convergent is newer than, than PL. Um, and then there's now even startups that are working on some of these technologies. And so um, very proud to say that actually like two of the most important projects in AI safety and BCI are part of the PL network. And so even though it might not be a large scale in terms of um, numbers of teams, uh, we have a, we've been uh, successful in kind of working with um, some of the groups that are um, having the most, the most um, impact. So <clears throat> there's a lot here. And uh, the question is kind of how do we drive uh, these breakthroughs in computing orienting towards safe outcomes across this kind of network oriented structure? Um, how do, can we kind of accelerate that good R&D uh, that can get us into good, good spots. And that's where the innovation network model um, uh, comes from. So uh, when you think about, I started going into this a little bit in terms of the R&D pipeline, but um, zooming out for a moment, um, at the end of the day, it's just about science and technology and how you couple those together and build, build products that can diffuse the innovation um, around the world. It's about how humanity learns more and figures out what will actually work, how, how those learnings can be translated into concrete um, uh, artifacts or uh, systems, uh, whether they're like physical or digital, um, that you can leverage, um, or, or social, like there are you know social technologies like um, language and um, cities and so on, um, and broadly this the currently in the you know last 20, 20, 40 years or so, uh, we've kind of created this very large innovation chasm between um, the early academic works that are uh, primarily driven by um, uh, academic credit and so on and then, then the broad um, technology development uh, incentive field um, around building products, building services, and scaling them uh, for diffusion. And that in-between spot um, gets um, not well-funded, not well-incentivized, and so on, which is why tons of really important innovations are stuck in the, um, in the academic pipeline or you know, are stuck in, in heads of people or in papers or in you know, discussion forums or, or even as pr practical implementations that got built to some extent, but then got stuck somewhere along the way and never actually diffused all the way. Um, so we've been very Bell Labs inspired from the very beginning, um, and I'll, I'll go into that a little bit more later, but um, the, the way that Bell Labs oriented this is to th think of the entire pipeline and structure programs and processes across this whole range of, of operations, and then um, was able to um, drive that kind of innovation that we kind of haven't seen since in terms of the uh, scale and predictability. Um, in, in one kind of um, broad organization. Uh, in reality, Bell Labs was kind of a system of organizations. When you peek under the hood, it wasn't um, just a single company. It was a whole system of, of things. Um, uh, but it's not quite the same thing as an, uh, uh, as an innovation network as we're talking about it now. Um, and so uh, there, I've seen a lot of questions about uh, kind of the difference between you know, single companies and innovation networks and kind of why a network and so on. Um, here's a, a list, I'll share some of this briefly 
Um, and I'm also very happy to kind of have one of the Palm sessions be about digging into this in detail and see how they're different. Uh, but the broad thinking around this is um, usually in kind of a single company, you have um, one corporation or a set of related corporations. You have primarily one dominant business um, that then ends up starving and stifling others and usually tends to lead to um, that culture and that uh, organization decaying over time. Um, you can see this in you know, the, all of the Silicon Valley tech companies uh, that have scaled and kind of gotten to the top tend to kind of decay down to um, some, um, some sort of steady state. Uh, you tend to have like highly hierarchical decision making. Um, you tend to be able to create great exceptional company cultures, uh, but those degrade with scale and time, usually somewhere between five and 10 years. If you're very, very good, you can stretch that out to maybe 20 years. Um, the big question mark was on, on Google this last uh, 30 years. Um, and it has not, uh, from my accounting, um, has not really panned out as maybe thought they thought it was going to. Um, single companies are good for sharing resources and establishing a different internal environment, but when you do that, you tend to increase the difference and you tend to create very strict boundaries and it becomes harder and harder and harder to collaborate across those boundaries. Um, usually IP becomes a big question um, and, and the broad innovation pipeline gets um, stifled by the weight of the single organization. Uh, it tends to also be very capital intensive um, uh, because you can't, you, you don't have good forms of sharing the upside with many other um, groups or, or investors and so on. Um, it's hard to do very significant R&D outside of the core domains. Some organizations manage to do this, but it's extremely difficult. Um, most organizations never even get to R&D in the first place. Um, and then you have tend to have a lot of coupled risk, risks that, um, end up inhibiting uh, the broad scale R&D. So it's really good for tightly related businesses, for products and R&D that is just kind of around one swath of things. If you're extremely good and lucky, you can maybe open up that aperture. Um, but in general, there, hasn't been, uh, good, there haven't been good examples in the last 20, 30 years of doing this uh, very well across a very large swath of different technologies. Um, uh, or at least you, it, it's sort of relative. Uh, there's some successes, but you can look at other models that are actually better. Uh, and it, this tends to be bad for a large span of independent projects, different businesses, products, R&D &D, R &D lines. So now let's, let's think of kind of innovation networks, and I picked uh, you know, sort of three examples to go, to, uh, go against these other ones. Um, first off, like think of Silicon Valley itself. Like the concept of Silicon Valley is an innovation network. It's not a, a um, very concrete one, um, uh, but, but it is, uh, uh, people have written about this for uh, many decades of kind of what was special about Silicon Valley and why it ended up manifesting the, the R&D that it did. There are you know, others before and others in other locations. Uh, you can think of uh, universities like um, uh, Stanford is one of the um, more uh, successful at this, but there are many, many across the world that do this uh, pretty well, uh, where they're able to create a, a kind of innovation network, but they usually don't route the capital flow back into the R&D pipeline, so they have a uh, Though they're concrete and you can point to them and you can see kind of research programs that are articulated um, and you can kind of see the boundary of the network, um, you, you don't have a way of cycling the, the, the ROI uh, because of kind of how universities are structured. Uh, and then you can think of something like YC as another kind of innovation network that is kind of tightly coupled to a specific phase in the pipeline, which is again, not in the early research part, but more in the productionization and scaling side. Um, and so this kind of broad concept of innovation networks um, you, you think of it as a, as a network of independent um, organizations or corporations, each one pursuing its own business, making own decisions, uh, but you can create the kind of internal environment um, sort of things that you can get in, in single companies uh, happening as a broad cultural structure or broad um, systems and services that are shared across those, those organizational boundaries. Uh, so think of it kind of like if a single company is one cell with a bunch of kind of a different internal environment than the, the harmful outside. Um, an innovation network is trying to create that kind of structure without the boundary cell wall, but having enough momentum inside that you get internal cohesion. It's closer to a colony of cells than, than you know, a single cell. Um, and part of why they're extremely good is they, they tend to create a resource sharing structure that isn't dependent on that single business. So if that single business succeeds or fails or degrades, um, it doesn't really affect the whole outcome of the, um, of the, of the network. Uh, and so that can keep gr gr uh, growing with many different um, structures. You get the, cu the coupled incentives, you get amortized failures, um, meaning um, 
groups can move across um, different efforts without kind of like blowing out the entire, all of the work that you've done for, you know, uh, a decade or two building up the structures. Um, this tends to be dramatically more capital efficient. You end up sharing a lot of the risks and the upside with uh, many other investors. So you can create structures that are just kind of astonishingly more capital efficient than, um, than, than uh, single companies. Um, and, it's, and so it's, it tends to be very good for a large span of independent uh, businesses, products, R&D lines. Uh, and it, it tends to be very bad for um, super tight coordination. Or it's not that it's bad, but it's not as good as um, a single company for tight coordination on one business, one product, one R&D line. So you know, this is another kind of way of looking at this, which is kind of taking some of those things and comparing it on a, uh, on a table. Uh, I didn't color code this one because uh, color coding it um, orients it to a specific approach. Um, I'm going to do this at some point to, to, for the kind of broad R&D question. But if your goal is to kind of get somewhere really fast with one product, like the, the network is, is um, it feels like a distraction. It feels like something um, uh, different. If you want to go really fast in one single product, um, usually kind of a single company is, is, um, um, uh, is better. Uh, but, but that's not what the mission of PL is, right? Like the mission of PL is this much broader, larger scale, larger scale thing. Um, it also happens that um, crypto networks by design and definition um, need innovation networks, not single corporations. And if you have a single corporation uh, driving most of the product development in a crypto network, um, the, the thing is likely gonna fail uh, sim because of how we've structured um, what it means to be a crypto network and what decentralization for a crypto network means. You need a structure that has resource sharing and independent risk decoupled structures um, across those things. So, so you can go through each of the crypto networks that are um, deployed out there today and try to classify them on the spectrum of how much are they like, are they driven by a very few amount of organizations or a very large amount of organizations that are um, more decoupled. You can, f you can scale that by capital, by the way. You can like normalize it to just kind of think about the same capital structure. Um, and you'll tend to find that um, the crypto networks uh, that do the innovation network part right uh, end up much more successful. Um, you know, another, this is kind of an old slide. Uh, it's another way of looking at it, which is kind of, um, Alphabet set out to do this kind of longer term R&D thing in, inside of a single corporation. Um, uh, and yet, it was not nearly as successful at doing this as it hoped to be. And when you compare it to the outcome of YC in that same time period, even though YC did not set out to do <laughs> what, uh, what Alphabet did, um, it's just kind of astonishingly um, better to be in the network model. Um, much stronger output and it, you know, much more capital efficient. Uh, now it's, uh, this suggests that you can create a crypto network like this um, to, to give you this kind of innovation structure. And that's what PL is going to be experimenting with and trying to figure out is like, can you create crypto network structures um, to do this kind of innovation? But that's kind of like a sub goal. That's not the main broad goal. Uh, the broad goal is to just get it right working whether, you know, with crypto structures or, or normal um, regular structures. Um, but there's kind of like an open opportunity there for being able to do this. And, and um, you know, build like the, a crypto network version of Silicon Valley. Like that's kind of what the, the, the potential uh, is. So this is kind of like a, like a diagram of the, the, um, um, of the, of the pipeline um, that I've kind of shared, shared in a bunch of places. Uh, here I kind of included also the, the structure of blue funds and green funds and um, kind of the um, yellow service teams because uh, all of that segment is required um, and critical in enabling this broad, longer term R&D, especially with the network orientation. Um, and that kind of like set of boxes in the middle is about like different kinds of instruments for doing the funding at different scales, which is what leads to these different funds, like um, green funds and blue funds tend to be different because the instruments and the return profile is different. Um, and again, happy to go into this into a lot of detail with if people want to dig more into this in a in a session. Um, yeah, here's like a zoomed in zoomed in view into each of the each of the sections. Um, by the way, the, the, the this kind of like shared services component um, was so fundamental for the development of Silicon Valley and the development of things like YC. Um, you were able to build an enormous scale of professional quality um, development that you didn't have to kind of build from scratch in one organization. And it's one of the things that led to Silicon Valley overtaking 
um, other, other uh, innovation environments. And so being able to kind of like build very high quality um, professional services that are not coupled to the single business, uh, but that are able to work across them, um, is kind of a, a huge advantage. Um, you know, another way of kind of looking at this is kind of where localizing some of the things that we've been talking about in, in, in the network uh, and kind of dis differentiating or distinguishing PL from, from these other things. Um, think of YC as kind of very, a, a network that's very oriented into this particular stage in the pipeline when you're going from um, something that like um, the, the concept of, concepts are broadly figured out and you're um, trying to productionize something and f trying to find product market fit and trying to then build a business and scale it. Um, and so this is kind of where YC, uh, YC sits. You can think of like specific VC funds uh, like ACES and C and others as kind of sitting downstream of that in a larger scale. It's worth noting that um, by my accounting, this, the ACES and C model is more profitable than the YC model uh, because you're able to kind of um, look at specific areas. But um, it is not successful at causing the, 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 the startups to emerge in the first place. Um, and so something like YC will kind of output more many more uh, potential opportunities, uh, which is interesting to see that now uh, ACNC is creating kind of its own version of YC, at least for, for crypto. So now localizing PL in this picture, um, th this is where it's different um, from these other things. It's not looking at a specific set of stages and trying to outcompete the other groups in that environment. It it's about looking at the entire end-to-end -end pipeline and build some structures along the way that can speed up that part of the pipeline, um, and that can uh, you, you look at the sort of the conversion rates along the way, and you focus your effort and energy to increase um, some of these areas, and you of course have to do that with with an eye towards um, uh, ROI along the way, and so you have to you, you have to couple this to the to the investing model because that's kind of the the currently the easiest way to um, uh, to have like a strong ROI here. Uh, the other way that's also potentially interesting is kind of the venture studio model, which uh, if we were to overlay it here, would be kind of in the development part, in like that chasm um, area. And so that's something that we, um, where the things like the big bets that we're exploring or like uh, the various set of bets that we're exploring um, sort of fit in. Uh, cool. So that's the, the broad mission and vision PL. Went very in depth here um, because uh, uh, a lot of the questions people had were kind of around this and kind of the why, the what, and the how. Uh, I'll now just speed through these next sections. That was kind of like 80% of the content. Um, so uh, I'll kind of just go through PL um, to just kind of zoom out, look at the whole picture, um, talk about the now and, and, and the near future. So um, you know, be before PL got started, um, kind of the things that led to the beginning of, of, of PL and the beginning of IPFS were um, a whole bunch of learning across many different um, fields. Uh, looking at the internet stack uh, across the board, learning how to build companies in the first place and learning how to build products. Um, and then, and, and so there's a whole track around internet um, uh, startups and so on and kind of developing that. There's a whole different track which is about noticing the, the innovation failures that, uh, that, that led to kind of wanting to create another Bell Labs type of environment. It was astonishing for me to read about the past and the kind of R&D that we used to do as a species uh, that we no longer do and why certain things are totally stuck and dead in the water now um, and kind of why, why, um, why that is. So I kind of set out to, so, so my broad plan, um, you know, even before PL, was to kind of find a good structure and a good business and then orient it towards solving this broader problem around, uh, around the pipeline. Um, this is kind of a, a bird's eye view of like, you know, the first uh, five years of PL's history kind of getting very start, uh, very getting started with a very little money um, from YC, like 120K was like the, the, the very beginning of this. Um, in fact, I worked on IPFS uh, for like many months, for like six, uh, six to eight months uh, with less than zero dollars. Uh, it was actually like completely, absolutely uh, broke. Uh, you, I, I can, I'm gonna potentially go into this more in detail tomorrow when I talk about kind of like the founder journey uh, type of story. Um, but that um, enabled the uh, enabled PL to get its start, and, and the big thing, the, the big kind of initial um, thing was kind of IPFS and Falcon together. Um, this was a period where there was a uh, it was, we were coming out of a crypto summer and into a winter, uh, and so that's why IPFS got developed first as opposed to Falcon because the winter made people have less attention on Falcon and more attention on IPFS. 
Um, and so I just kind of followed and pursued the, the path of um, um, you know, product market fit. Uh, that led to kind of the beginning of Go IPFS, um, launching the alpha, um, uh, socializing in a bunch of different places. The community started growing from, from early days and contributing a ton. We started building a larger company. Um, then we were able to uh, raise a uh, funding around in 2016. So note, note that like um, up until 2016, for like two years, 600K supported about you know, 12 people um, for that entire time period. Um, then that led to, uh, then you know, Go IPFS continued uh, with a ton of traction, uh, tons of scale, uh, lots of contributors. Then we started refactoring the stack to add things like Lip2P and IPLD, multi-formats and so on. We then turned our attention back into, back towards Falcon to develop it. Uh, there's so many people around in the room today that were here for that period when people were like, why are we doing this Falcon thing? Like, it seems like a huge distraction over uh, over IPFS, and or even why are we doing this Lip2P thing? It's like, it seems like a huge distraction over uh, over IPFS, um, but it's sort of like fundamental in, in kind of the model of how do you build the financial structure to develop all of these all of these systems. Um, we built the we developed the SAFT, then um, we uh, put out the Filecoin um, white paper round two. Uh, this you know two year lag where like we didn't do much in Filecoin during this period. Uh, what was neat about this is that Ethereum developed. Uh, alongside, and we were very involved in the Ethereum community because of IPFS and the applications there, and, and more because of the social structures. Um, and so we were able to kind of learn a ton of lessons from, from Ethereum, Ethereum along the way, and then use a lot of the tech that they built. Um, then we had the um, broad announcements of Filecoin, we um, ran the Filecoin uh, 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 staff sale. We also had the first official new creation of, uh, of PL, which is um, Coinless. We built this entire, uh, platform to do this fundraising, and then we nucleated that as an entity, and as a, its own company. Um, uh, we weren't using the term nucleation at the time, but, but that's kind of like the first example of like creating another organization. And, and at that point, once we had, uh, that, that led to a, a pretty large fundraise, and, and at that point, that, now that we had um, a larger scale of funding, we were able to then start funding projects on larger scale, not just our own individual um, uh, uh, people uh, working on our core projects, but we, we started going into grant funding and we had RFPs, we built an RFP program, we um, uh, worked with a bunch of different centers. And uh, for those of, uh, of you around at the time, we started kind of socializing the, this concept of PL as like a seller nursery of like creating different projects and different uh, businesses and so on and enabling them to scale. Um, and then we sort of like, at that point, sort of scaled up to um, kind of about 100 people. I, I might be getting the, the counts off here, because, um, yeah, I just did this quickly. And then second, there's a massive scale of contributors um, uh, around this, this kind of like smaller core set. Um, and so that, you know, in, in terms of scales, we're talking about like thousands of people at this point working across all our projects. Then kind of the five years after that, we had to focus super hard on Falcoin for, you know, 2019, 2020. Uh, so super like difficult time period for a bunch of reasons. Um, uh, but we built it. We built uh, the beginnings of Falcoin, and we got to um, the Alphanet, if people remember that, um, and then the Testnet, and then from there into the Falcoin Space Race, and then the mainnet launch. There was there were other stuff going on uh, uh, d during this period and a bunch of other projects. But my memory is like a blur at this point. And uh, <laughs> and when making this slide yesterday, we just kind of um, was very focused on that. And then from there, in kind of 2020, um, late 2020, early 21 by looking at the whole pipeline and looking at crypto networks and looking at um, uh, kind of like the end games or like not end games, but like mid games and the end games of, um, of these uh, types of systems. That's when kind of the decision to transition to the network um, came into view and, and um, uh, it made the decision to go in, in, in this direction. And we rolled that out into in Lab Week 21. We talked about kind of this broad transition into the network. Um, uh, we introduced the concept of nucleations. Um, I think it became a drinking game at some point. Uh, um, uh, we formed teams to do the builder's funnel, the town funnel, network infrastructure, network goods, uh, and, and so on. Uh, then we went into um, uh, 22. Uh, lots of things uh, happened in 22. Uh, people's memories here will um, be, be uh, uh, really good and better than mine. Um, we then, in terms of Falcon, we focused really hard on scaling data onboarding and driving that as a, as a big piece. Um, then we kind of built out the accelerator program and the VC program. 
um, we, we had already been doing a lot of investment by this point. So the first network investments were starting to happen in 2017. That's when we invested in things like Starkware and um, uh, other things that are now pretty, pretty successful. Um, and then we just kind of scaled up that program to uh, enable it to, to tr uh, turn into the network. Uh, we had LabWeek 22. Um, then we, from there, we've been um, working on various projects like you know, the launch of FVM, the formation of Big Vets. Uh, where we have LabWeek 23 coming up. Um, and this is just only a small sampling of the massive scale of stuff that is happening across the entire network. Um, so now kind of thinking about PL in you know, the present, present state, um, uh, kind of setting aside the, there's, there's all of the projects that all of the individual teams are working on, but just kind of looking at the network infrastructure. Um, think of the broad, uh, the, the notion of like sort of like what PL is, is this broad network of teams, um, lots of different, different activity across, uh, across it. And then we have a set of infrastructure teams that are supporting the network. Um, and this is where, where this picture of you know, building the network, uh, helping teams start, connecting them to capital and talent and knowledge and services comes from. Um, you know, I'm gonna just, th this is all kind of in, in, in broader decks that you can, you can find, but this is kind of sort of the scale that we're dealing with. We now have hundreds of companies in the network, thousands of people in the, in the, in the, in the network. Um, we have you know, systems that help groups coordinate in terms of finding each other as teams, finding each other as people, office hours or, or other, uh, other kinds of support structures. We enable a lot of teams to get started through things like the accelerator programs um, and early you know, hackathons and grant programs. We then help groups connect to larger scales of capital, um, you know, for everything from angel to seed to uh, larger VC funds and, and so on. We have this broad model of different uh, fund structures for different sizes and different scales. We have a kind of this broader portfolio. Um, and we also want to connect all of the teams and, and uh, uh, with really good, good talent so that uh, that's where kind of the talent uh, network funnel or talent network as we're calling it now uh, sort of came from um, to help kind of organize you know, hundreds of teams and, and thousands of people. Uh, and you know, this broad swath of services that we're, we're developing. So all kinds of things uh, to help coordinate across the network from you know, um, really kind of local source of things like local dinners and um, uh, lab day and things short in time or kind of updates to then this broad, uh, broad thing around kind of more supporting the entire network, tell its stories and its messages and, and broadly disseminate what they're working on to, uh, our, to the broad, broad landscape and then do things like Lab Week to help bring the network together and help form and help um, coordinate. Um, so kind of in, in terms of the, I'll flash them again, like in terms of the concrete goals of the concrete projects, there's an enormous amount of, um, of, of people and teams working across this whole swath of um, kind of indi individual goals. And this is just a, a, a kind of sampling of these. So now kind of talking about the, the future, and I'm gonna uh, refresh. Um, you know, it's extremely difficult to predict what's gonna happen in the next 10 years, um, but I'll kind of just give some broad strokes uh, of this. So first off, like the most important thing that we're gonna be facing as a, as a group, as a species, is the rollout of some of these technologies that are going to fundamentally shift and change what it means to be human, um, much more than, than these things did. Um, it'll be, it's unclear, um, it's unclear if we'll get any big results of, in this, of this kind in this decade. Um, if I had to bet today, I think the bet would be on um, ML systems uh, and getting to, getting pretty close to things like AGI. Um, it's extremely difficult to estimate timelines, but um, you know things like OpenAI are targeting 2026, 2028, um, which is not very far from now. That would be like transcendental if we get there. Um, also very risky. Um, not going to go into that. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but then BCI. So, so from my perspective, like the the prioritization right now should be in in, in slowing down. AI and speeding up BCI as much as we can. Um, and so that's where uh, we're very underserved in terms of the, the scale of, um, of effort there. Uh, I think companies like Science, I think it will have a pretty significant impact, but we need kind of like 10 to 100 of these, not, not you know, one or two. Um, but um, hopefully we'll kind of like steer the, the pathway well here. Uh, the broad thing that we can do is create an environment where starting those kinds of things um, can be dramatically easier. And starting those things looks fundamentally different than starting uh, crypto projects or crypto networks, right? It's just a very different type of environment if you're doing kind of neurotechnology type of work. 
Um, and so in order to build the, the support structures for those systems, um, that, that looks different. Um, by the way, access to capital is one of the core things in all of this, which is why um, we even, were even involved in that, uh, were successfully involved in that, in that space. Um, then kind of thinking about individual kind of goal sets um, or, or projects, unclear to, to say where we'll be in this, in this particular um, set of missions. Um, I think we have a pretty good chance of baking in some of these rights into the network in the next 10 years. Um, things like at least kind of the secure uh, publishing and distribution of content, I think we can, we can get there. Um, it'll be difficult to get there in terms of private read, reader writer privacy. Uh, I think we can make significant improvements, uh, but, it, but we won't yet be at, I, my prediction is we won't yet be at full reader writer privacy across the entire internet for all content uh, within 10 years. Um, it'd be great if we did uh, and we should try, um, but, but that seems kind of like a little harder. Um, now, you know, individual projects and individual missions will hopefully be, be at, at much larger scales. Um, if kind of IPFS keeps growing at the, at the rate it has been, um, it, it'll, it'll be hitting like billions of, of humans at that point, um, which will be pretty, pretty awesome. Um, if Hotline keeps growing at the rate it does, then um, it needs to do better math on this, but I think we, we could be hitting in the, in, the, um, uh, in the zettabytes by the end of the decade. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, we, we will have to like figure it out. Um, it might be like multiple zettabytes. I've, I've consistently underestimated the scale and speed at which crypto networks can, can accumulate uh, hardware and accumulate uh, resources. So, uh, you know, I sort of was thinking and predicting like tens to hundreds of petabytes for the beginning of Falcon and we, you know, hit an exabyte like very fast. Um, so this could, be, this could be much faster. In terms of economic systems, um, uh, I think this is where like there's a lot more question marks. Uh, there's a lot less people working on this kind of stuff than, than there should be. And so this is an area of a lot of um, work and investment that, that should happen across the space, especially as we go out of the crypto winter into a crypto summer, uh, we should kind of be routing a lot of the, the, um, the kind of like development and so on to, to systems like these. Um, and then in terms of the R&D, broad R&D pipeline, um, hopefully we can get to a spot where it becomes a lot easier to kind of find uh, these uh, breakthrough big bet type of ideas and then start them within the network. Um, today, like if you were to start um, something uh, with, with, a, with a lot of experience, you tend to not go to YC and that's something, that's an incentive structure that's to the detriment of YC and we have to figure an incentive structure for us that where like it just cleanly always makes sense to, to come work with a network. Um, uh, here are like some of the kinds of things that we, we're talking about. Uh, this is m now much more zooming into the next, you know, year, two years, uh, three years. Things like, you know, we, we need some form of PL network membership structure that like we have to kind of formalize so people, we can see what teams and, and groups are, are involved and what kind of access they get to different shared uh, network resources. Um, we want to create this like broad unifying platform across the network. Um, Spaceport um, has been pioneering that with a directory. Um, we want to kind of expand that tool and that system to create a, a pretty important um, way of kind of collaborating and being pretty effective across the network. Um, we want to uh, build ways of um, better connecting the, the talent uh, across, the, uh, across the network and helping support uh, companies with, um, w with advice along the way and, and with um, helping them find the, the, um, the people they need. Uh, and we want to create, like, we, we want to have a very clear picture of the conversion rates along the way in, in the entire pipeline uh, to see kind of where the gaps are and what, what's working, what's not working, where should we be uh, focused on and, and so on. Um, now, in terms of kind of like the funding or the teams for funding structures, uh, we want to hit, like we're currently at hundreds of blue to green teams. Um, we want to hit like thousands um, in kind of like the short two to three, four year time scale. We want to uh, hopefully be in the tens of thousands by the end of the decade. That would be a pretty, pretty uh, great place to be. Um, that would probably back into um, thousands of service providers or hundreds to thousands of service providers, depending on the scale, um, to support, you know, if you're supporting like 10,000 teams, uh, that usually kind of like an order of magnitude lower is, is probably a reasonable kind of up, upper bound. And so this might be like low tens of service providers until maybe, which is kind of where we are now um, for the next few years, but then maybe uh, scaling up afterwards. Uh, in terms of green funds, um, this is not a single fund type thing. It's like you want a whole network of funds. Um, we Here in, in the green side, we can just tap into the broad investment capital of the world. We can lean into you know tens of thousands of angels out there, the, hundreds of large scale venture capital funds and so on. Um, and then in terms of blue funds, this is where it's harder because the blue fund world is like much sparser and, and it's, it just tends to be very top heavy. Um, 
it would be amazing to create the structure in crypto that enables like things like tens of thousands of angel sized impact funds to to happen where you're like deploying small amounts of capital like five thousand to fifty thousand dollars or two hundred thousand dollars level of scale as you know single individuals being able to make those decisions and routing that capital um, often is not there angels tend to invest their own capital but recently there's a lot of structures that enable angels to route capital and finding a good way of doing that in the impact side could be just enormous. Um, and it would be really great to get to kind of hundreds of VC sized impact funds by, by the end of the decade. This is gonna be, you know, blue funds are way, it, it, that's at, uh, in the green fund side, we're like lucky to rely on the broad world having really good investment structures. In the blue fund size side, um, we're dealing with like a pretty broken system today that um, in my view, for certain parts used to work a lot better in the past. Um, so we'll have to think through um, sort of how to get there. And one big thing that we're gonna be working on is, um, and we've made a ton of progress on, is, is to kind of like figure out some kind of asset structure where there's one or multiple types of assets that can create incentive structure for, for the people and the teams and companies across the network to collaborate um, and to create value together. And that's a really key, uh, key point in, in making the network um, uh, sustainable and, and growing over time. Um, and I think like much more successful than, than, uh, than other things.